Common ancestry is the idea that you share a common ancestor with someone or something else. For instance, the most recent common ancestor of you and your cousin is your shared grandmother. Now, as it happens, we have a familial relationship with all life on Earth, and this fact has been vindicated by genetics, biogeography, embryology, homologous structures, atavisms, fossils, and even mathematics. Just see my Evidence for Evolution playlist, which is still growing. Or you could review Wikipedia's expansive Evidence of Common Descent. Here, we will lay the foundation for our later talks on common ancestry. This video will incorporate much of what I've talked about in previous videos, plus a bit of the history of evolutionary thought. In later videos, we'll look at the fossils and evolutionary developmental biology involved in reconstructing common ancestors. So let's jump right in. In years past, fossils were our only window into the history of life. Fossils were originally mistaken for all sorts of things. Dragons, cyclopses, giants, etc. But over time, natural scientists learned that these were the remains of long-dead creatures. Even before evolution was discovered, naturalists knew there was an age of fish, an age of reptiles, and then an age of mammals. The geologists that preceded Darwin were already aware of geologic periods, such as the Silurian, Cretaceous, and Quaternary, which are respectively members of each age. They were also aware of the Carboniferous, Triassic, Jurassic, Devonian, and Permian. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, French naturalist Georges Cuvier realized from fossils such as the Mastodon, Megatherium, Pterodactylus, and Mosasaurus that organisms went extinct over Earth's history, which was considered heretical at the time due to the religious belief that God didn't kill off his own creations. Modern creationists have no problem accepting extinction events, especially since over 99% of organisms died shortly after vacating the Ark. Anyway, this, and clergyman Thomas Malthus's idea that organisms compete for limited resources, greatly influenced Darwin. Building on the work that had been accruing for at least decades, Darwin formulated his theory of natural selection, which was discussed in Mechanisms of Evolution. Despite the critics, Darwin's theory has been massively supported in the years hence. It's an inevitable consequence of organisms interacting in an environment with limited resources. One of the most famous experiments of natural selection concerns the peppered moth. Let's have a quick look. During Great Britain's Industrial Revolution, the population of generally white Bestom Betularia transitioned to mostly black as soot from the factories covered the forests. The reason for this was that the black moths were camouflaged against the trees, so predatory birds picked off the white moths. Thus, the black moth offspring survived in greater number than the white moths. Then, once laws were passed to limit the pollution, the soot was reduced and the white moth population rose. Now, the inability of researchers to replicate some aspects of HBD Kettlewell's peppered moth findings didn't go over well. The experiment was dismissed, and for years, creationists and intelligent design advocates laughed heartily over the whole thing, claiming that the lack of testing of natural selection supports creationism. Then, along came population geneticist Michael Majerus, who posthumously published a massive study showing that Kettlewell's work was correct. Birds did select the moths. Today, creationists accept the results, saying that there was no change in kinds, so creationism is still vindicated. Heads I win, tails you lose. So, as time has gone on, more and more fossils have been found, demonstrating common ancestry. I discussed a number of different lineages in the video pointing to common ancestry because that's what fossils alone do. They point to the conclusion. Add them to the various other biological fields and the case for common descent becomes practically impenetrable. But even if evolution as we know it now were to be overturned, then the new theory would still have to incorporate all fossils as well as all other demonstrable facts that the current theory has accrued. You can't build a better theory than the current one by ignoring way over half the data, as I demonstrated creationists do in my video, We All Have the Same Data and Genesis Paradise Lost. And, evolution would still be true on genetics alone, even if no fossils were found. But we do have fossils, and they do support evolution. Why? Because fossils show a progression of forms. 
not a ladder-like progression towards higher or lower organisms, but a progression from less to more derived forms. The fact is that as we go deeper into the fossil record, the more that closely related organisms look the same. For instance, the oldest ancestors of mammals, such as Archaeothyrus, look like the oldest ancestors of modern reptiles, such as Hylonomus. But we don't have to go back in deep time to see this. Just go backwards from two modern dog breeds to their common ancestor. Creationists will happily do this, saying, yes, the common ancestor of two dogs was a dog. I imagine they'd do the same for two different species of finch. They'd say, yes, the common ancestor of the Azores bullfinch and the white-cheeked bullfinch was a finch. Okay. Would creationists also say that the grosbeak is related to the finch? What about the yellow-crowned euphonia? What about the brambling? The golden pipit? The northern gray-headed sparrow? The olive warbler? The Asian fairy bluebird? The pink-tailed bunting? Parrots? Falcons? Owls? Hawks? Waders? Sandpipers? Flamingos? Petrels? Pigeons? Hummingbirds? Nightjars? Fowl? Ratites? Would creationists laugh that the common ancestor of all birds was just a bird? Would they go through the same process for all mammals? The fact is that all birds are related to each other, as are all mammals, as are all organisms. This is not a just-so story, as creationists want people to believe it can be demonstrably shown. The 2010 paper, A Formal Test of the Theory of Universal Common Ancestry, looks at universally conserved proteins to determine what the most parsimonious explanation is for their conservation. Universal common ancestry is by far the most parsimonious answer. Yes, Darwin's conclusion that all life is related is not only confirmed observationally, but also experimentally. Similarly, the 1982 paper, Testing the Theory of Evolution by Comparing Phylogenetic Trees Constructed from Five Different Protein Sequences, says, quote, The theory of evolution predicts that similar phylogenetic trees should be obtained from different sets of character data. We have tested this prediction using sequence data for five proteins from 11 species. Our results are consistent with the theory of evolution. Close quote. Let's recap. We saw that naturalists realized that there were distinct ages of animals before anyone knew what evolution was. We saw that natural selection has been experimentally validated. We saw yet another reason to dismiss baromenology. And we saw two different experiments that validate common ancestry. Don't think we're done. We've barely scratched the surface of common ancestry, as we'll see in later videos. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.